All right, so the last time we, we left off, we, I, I'd finished the first topic, the first section, and then I hopped into the interactive programs using the scanner class. So I'm going to continue where I left off, which was variables and assignments. So I'm going to hop down to variables and assignments. All right, variables and assignments. A variable name is a location for, or excuse me, variable is a name for a location in memory that holds a value. A variable declaration specifies the variable's name and the type of information that it will hold. So here is a declaration. You have the type of data the variable is going to hold, and then you have the variable name, which is a valid Java identifier. If you go back to chapter one, there was rules on our identifiers. Does anybody remember some of the rules that will make an identifier invalid? Right, it, it, can't, it can't be a keyword. That's a good one. Anybody else? So, yeah, it can't start with the number, right? So it's allowed to have numbers, uh, letters, and um, the underscore and the dollar sign, but it can't actually start with the number. It can't be a uh, reserved Java word, right? That was one of the other ones. And in addition to that, there are coding standards with this class. So if you're going to create a variable name, there is uh, some documentation on the case of the variable, and it should be, uh, it should start with the lowercase letter, and if there's an additional word, like if it's two words, then it's gonna be camel case where the second uh, word will be capitalized. All right, so it's gonna start with the lowercase letter, and then this, if it has a second word, it'll be capitalized. Okay, so here they're giving you a declaration of one variable, and they're showing that you can also create multiple variables by declaring the data type and then the name of each variable, right? And in between each, you have a comma. And then when you're done, you put a semicolon um, to end the line. Okay, we initialize variables using the equal sign. So a variable can be given an initial value in the declaration. So here they're giving sum an initial value of zero. And then here they're giving base an initial value of 32 and max initial value of 49, right? So Max data type is int, right? So on this one line, they're declaring multiple variables and they're initializing them at the same time. So they're saying int base is equal to 32 and then int max is equal to 149. When a variable is referenced in a program, its current value is used. Okay, so they're, kind of, they're giving you an example here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my own example really quick. Let me just... Yeah, I'll come back and I'll do an example. All right, so here they're giving an example with the piano keys where they set piano keys to 88 and then they just printed out the value of piano keys, right? The real simple program and there's the output, right? They said piano keys is 88 and then they printed out the value. Whenever you assign a value, um, we use the equal statement, okay? So this is called the, uh, the assignment. An assignment statement changes the value of a variable the assignment operator is the equal sign. So here they're saying total is equal to 55. The value that was in total is overwritten. You can only assign a value to a variable that is consistent with the variable's declared type. So what they mean by that is you can only assign an integer to a variable designed to hold an int, okay? Um, you can't assign a string value to an integer, right? Then, um, it won't compile. You can't assign a floating point value that's uh, decimal, right? A number with some decimal values. You can't assign that to an integer value, okay? So the type of data you assign has to be consistent with the data type. And then here they give you an example where they created int sides of seven and then they printed out sides and then they changed the value of sides to 10. They printed it out and they changed it to 12. They printed it out. Pretty straightforward and that's the results. A constant, okay, so we can declare something to be constant by using the final modifier. If you look down here at the bottom, there's this reserve word final. They're putting final in front of the data type, and then they're putting it in all caps. That's This is what we call a naming convention. This is also in your coding standard. If something is going to be constant, meaning it can only be, it, it, don't, it only can uh, be assigned a value one time, then it needs to be in all caps, okay? And that is described in our coding standard. And that's why they capitalize here. It's just something conventional. Most, place, most places implement that. 
A constant is an identifier that is similar to a variable except that it holds the same value the, during, the same value during its entire existence. As the name implies, it is constant, not, not, a, not variable. The compiler will issue an error if you try to change the value of a constant. In Java, uh, we will use the final modifier to declare a constant. And then here they give you an example of declaring a constant. Constants are useful for three important reasons. First, they give meaning to an otherwise unclear literal value. So they give you an example. They say max load means um, more than the literal value 250. So what their meaning is, so what they mean here is if you come across some type of equation and then you see uh, 250, you're probably going to wonder, like, like, why 250? Like, what was the purpose of 250? But if you declare a constant, you can give it a, a variable name that has some type of meaning of what it actually describes. And then you can... And then when somebody has to do code maintenance on your, your code that you've written, they'll be able to identify, hey, 250 is the value for the max load. Okay. Second, they facilitate program maintenance. If a constant is used in multiple places, its value need only to be set in one place. Okay. So there's another advantage of using a constant is uh, to say you're just using... I don't know, like the number of students in this class, right? It's like 24 is the number of students that registered for this class. So I'm writing a program that somehow maintains like just uh, grades and work that people do in this class. And everywhere I'm using 24 to represent the number of students in the class, right? So there's at least a dozen spots where I wrote 24, like the literal value 24, okay? Now a few students drop by the mid semester, right? So now I'm down to like 19. Now every word that I wrote 24, I'm gonna have to go back and write 19, right? But if I would have declared a variable up top to say number of students in class is equal to 24, and then every word that I needed to use 24, I just used that constant, right? Then when, I, when it does need to change, I'll just go back and change it to 19 in my program. Okay, so you just change it one spot and it, you're, if everybody used that value, like if you never just got lazy and typed out 24, then that variable would be applied to whatever equations that you plug that value into. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, so in this in this course, I am going to make you use yes. So whenever you do declare the number of students, do you use the number of students or? Uh, the number, or? So the name the name that you want to give a variable um, all depends on. Well, there is some context applied to that constant. So um, to say if you want to use 24 for something else, right? Just say there's 24 students and there's also 24 computers in this classroom, right? You wouldn't use the number of students to represent the number of computers because the number of computers in the classroom, right, is, can be different than the number of uh, computers in the classroom. It just so happens to be that they're the same. So if you're going to create a constant for some value like the number of students make sure you only use it for the number of students even though it might match the number of computers in this classroom so you want to put some context behind these values yes so like uh, so like you've got max load for example so if you have something like that for number of students you would always use that like in place instead of writing 24 and then it'll automatically put that in there right right okay so that's what you're saying right and then i mean a lot of the programs that we're writing are like fairly simple, but as you move along into uh, you know your software career, you're going to come across programs that have thousands of files, right? So you're going to have these constants that you're going to define somewhere, and and every every place that you need that value, you're going to reference those values. Okay, so um, to answer your question, or at least the question that I think that you're an answering, um, you don't want to make a constant called the num 24 and then make it equal to 24 and then wherever you need 24 you just use num 24 right because like you're putting no real meaning behind that variable name does that make sense you make it a shorter? well you don't make it shorter like like you need to explain what that number 24 actually means like if it was students, right like number of students or yeah students uh, and like it depends on what you want to do uh, or how you want to name the, those values, but it does need to be in all caps.
Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and do an example uh, shortly because we're coming to the end of this section. So third, they formally established a value, or excuse me, third, they formally established a value should not change, avoiding inadvertent errors by other programmers. Okay, so that's the third advantage of constants. If you know uh, when you run this program, you don't want it to change for the duration of the program. Um, you make a constant and you require everybody to use that value. Okay, now, of course, uh, if multiple programmers are working on the same code, like maybe some of them get lazy and they don't use a constant, but if everybody does, right, um, they won't, like, it would stay consistent in every location in the equation, and you can avoid situations where a, pro a programmer will change the value to something uh, off from what the actual value is supposed to be. Okay? All right, so that is the end of variables and assignments. I'm going to just do a quick example. Okay, so in the Dropbox folder, shared Java content, I'm going to create a file called, uh, in the chapter two demos folder, I'm going to call, make an example called variables and assignments demo. Okay, I'm going to just copy this name because I don't have to rewrite it again. And I'm going to save. And then I'm going to create my class header. Here's the name of my class. And then my method header, public static void main string array arguments. So let me turn down the lights in here. I, they're too bright. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just create a couple of variables, kind of show you the, some of the examples that the book was giving you. So this is what we call declaring a variable. Okay, so I'm gonna say int my num is equal to seven. Whoop, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and leave out the assignment. Okay, so that just right, like just that part right there is our declaration. So I'm telling Java, I'm gonna, I want the identifier my num to be a variable that is going to hold an integer, okay? And that's, and Java's gonna reserve my num, so it cannot be used anywhere else, otherwise you'll get a compiler Right, if I try to redeclare that to be something else, Java's gonna get upset and it's not gonna compile. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and just compile this to make sure it actually does compile. I pressed control one to compile, it does compile, okay? But if I came over here and say, you know what, I wanna make a double also called my num. So I'm declaring the same name, but this time I'm saying I want the data type to be double, which is a number that holds a fractional part. But now if you look, when I go to compile, Java's really upset at me. It's, if you read the actual error, it tells you my num is already defined in method uh, main and is pointing to my num, right? So it's basically saying you've already declared that variable. You can't use it again. You can't redeclare it. If I, in fact, I, if I did want a double to hold a number, then I have to give it a different identifier name. So in this case, I'm just gonna go with my num two, okay? And now when I save and I compile, compiles, okay? So one thing that we haven't done is we haven't assigned a value to any of these variables, but I'm gonna go ahead and just print them out. Does anybody know what value it's gonna be contained inside of these? Well, yeah, that's true, it will be a whole number. But what, act what whole number? Uh, so it actually will be something. It would, it's actually going to be zero. Okay, so Java, if you don't declare a value, Java will tell you it needs to be declared. Wait, hold on, let me compile real quick because there's two situations there. Okay, so we didn't initialize it, so Java, in fact, did complain about it. But if there's some situations where if you don't actually 
uh, assign a value and there's no way for the compiler to know that you assigned a value, then a zero will actually gets put in place. Okay, now in this situation, because the program is pretty primitive, meaning I'm not referencing other files where these variables live, um, it actually didn't compile because Java is smart enough to know, hey, you haven't even initialized those values yet. You can't print them out. Okay, so before I use them, I'm going to have to give them some initial value. And to do that, I'm going to make an assignment statement. So here, I'm going to say assignment statement. Okay, so I have my num, and I'm going to just say my num is seven, and then my num two is going to be, I don't know, 89.1234. I'm going to save that, compile. It does compile, and then I'm going to go ahead and run that. All right, and those that's the output. Okay, so we have my num is seven, and my num two is 89.1234. Okay, so this is how we declare, and this is how we assign. Now, you can group them together. So if I, in fact, wanted to declare some other variables, let's say, like, uh, I, want, I want more integer variables. I'll just say, like, num1, num2, and num3. There's me declaring them, and I can also assign them values on uh, that line. I can just say... Num1 is 4, num2 we'll say is 7, and num3 is negative 2. Let me put this, put a comment here. I'm going to say declare multiple and assign. All right, so now I'm going to just print those values out really quick. And I'm going to change these real quick. All right, so compile, run, and there you go. Okay, so those are the variables that I declared. All right, so now let's talk about the constant. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and make another example for the constant. So go ahead and say new, and then I'm going to save as, and... I'm going to name this constant, constants, or con, is that the way you spell it? Con, I don't know. I'm so confused. Okay, constant, and um, I'll just call it example. All right, I'm going to copy this because I don't want to have to write it later. I'm going to save, I'm going to create my class header. So I'm going to say public class, the name of my class, and then my method header, no oh, dang, which is public static void main all right so what I'm gonna do in here is I'm gonna find a purpose or a reason for using uh, some type of constant hmm let me just think about this because I don't actually I don't actually have examples in my head I just come up with them on the fly um, I know one of the examples I did for the online class and I did put that on YouTube was uh, making a grade uh, thing that uh, thing that averages grades. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that as well. Well, no, then you have two examples of the same thing. Um, hmm. Okay, I am going to just use like the number of students. I just don't know how I'm gonna use the number of students. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just say, um, the, the way you declare a constant is you say final and then int, and then when you, whenever you make a constant, you're going to put it on all caps, and you, there's no way to camel case multiple letters. So if this was like an integer that changed, would say like num of students, right? But to replicate that as a constant, you would just use num underscore of students okay and we'll just say the number of students in here are 24 right and I'm gonna say system dot out 
dot print line. I'm going to say number of students in the class. Or in the class, how about enrolled in the class? Just a question. Yes. Whatever you were typing out, caps, no students, you just tab it and it'll auto complete it or no? Uh, yeah. After, well, and this, it depends on the type of editor you're using. Yeah. So, wait, did I do that? I don't know. Or you just check, check it out. Okay, so in Notepad, you can do that and not in TextPad. Okay. So, I know that's one of the cool things about Notepad is that. If you declare a variable up top, it knows that it's a variable, and then it kind of gives you like a shortcut to it, like whenever you're typing, where you can just click on it or tab it out, and it will finish the line for you. Um, maybe I should use Notepad++. You're, you're making me miss it now. All right. Um, so system out print line number of students enrolled. I'm going to go ahead and just compile this. So Control One. Let me look at my output, and then run it. And it says the number of students in the class or enrolled in the class is 24. So I'm going to go ahead and try to change this value and let's just see what happens. Now I'm going to uh, set the value to 12. Okay, and now when I compile, it doesn't compile, right? So Java immediately knows when you go to compile that you're trying to change the value of a constant and it won't let you do it. If I were to remove the final modifier, that means it's not actually a constant, it's just a variable. Then when I go to compile and run, it is okay with the value being changed, okay? So once you put the final on it, that's it. Throughout the duration of the program, whatever value is there is going to be what you reference. Okay, and this is something I'm going to require you to do whenever uh, you do any of the equations in the pro or yeah, any of the equations in the chapter two homework. So if you read the instructions of the homework, um, I, I have additional instructions on the description of how to do your homework. And what I want you to do is make constants for anything that is literal inside of an equation. Okay, so an example, let me just do another quick example. Um, I'm going to make new, oh, and I'm going to save this as, I'm going to call this square calculator. All right, so I'm going to use the scanner class in this. Oh, you know, let me, I haven't been doing this. I don't want to get you guys in bad habits. So I should be putting like name and info up top. Okay, so I'm going to import the scanner class, meaning I'm going to prompt the user for information. So I'm going to say import java.util.scanner. And then I'm going to say public class and then square calculator, open, close, curly braces. And then my main method header is public static void main that takes in a string array arguments, open, close, curly braces. And then inside of here, what I'm going to do is declare a scanner object. So I'm going to call this one scan is equal to new, oops, new scanner. It's going to listen to the keyboard. Okay, and I'm going to take in, um, let me see, the length of a side of a uh, square. Okay, so I'm going to have an integer for, actually, maybe I should make it a float. I have a float for the, um, the length. And then I'm going to prompt the user. I'm going to do print. That way, like, the prompt is on the same line um, as the entry. So I'm going to say enter the length of a side of the square. They're going to give me some value and then I'm going to save that value to length by saying length is equal to whatever the scanner pulls from the call next int 
And then the next thing I want to do is I want to calculate, let's just say I'm going to calculate area, okay? Or maybe perimeter. I don't know, which one? It doesn't matter. Which one's the easier one? Area is side times side, and then perimeter is the side uh, added, like the sum of the sides four times, right? So the sides times four, right? Um, so we'll do perimeter, you know, let's just do them both, right? They're really simple um, equations. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say, okay, well my perimeter of my square is gonna be equal to whatever my length is times the number of sides of a square. Wait, am I spelling this right? So length, and then times the number of sides of a square, which is um, four, okay? And then my area is gonna be equal to my length times my length. Okay, and then I'm just gonna print out system dot out dot print line. Say the the area or how about the perimeter of the square is, and then give them concatenate in some value, which is perimeter. then area is gonna be whatever my area is. Okay, I'm gonna just put some code comments right here and say equation for perimeter. All right, save that. Let me scroll down a little bit so you can see all the code at one time, okay. All right, so everything looks good. I prompt the user for data. He's gonna enter the data. Actually, I made a mistake. I haven't even compiled yet, but I'm scanning for an integer, but I'm storing the value into a float. It's gonna work. It's gonna compile and run fine. It's just the value. If I put like a 0.5 or 0.3, it's gonna forget that value because uh, it's converting the data as an int and then storing it into a float. So I'm gonna actually say next float instead of next int. Save that and compile. It does compile, that's always a good sign. Enter the length of a side of the square, the length of a side of a square. Okay, so I'm gonna just say like 5.2, okay? And there is my perimeter, that's 5.2 plus 5.2 plus 5.2 plus 5.2, that makes sense. And then 5.2 times 5.2, that's my area, and there is my value. And I think the actual value might actually be 27.04, but then there's like this weird thing going on here. So the reason for that is in programming languages, it doesn't know anything about decimal, right? Whenever a computer actually does math, it has to convert a decimal number, meaning base 10, to base two, which is binary, and do the actual math, and then convert it back to decimal. Um, there is a IEEE standard on how accurate this should be, and Java and most programming languages will comply with that IEEE standard. Uh, however, if you are, if you want the exact value, there are classes in Java that you can use. We'll talk more about classes in chapter three, but there are classes you can use in Java to retain uh, pertinent decimal information if you're doing like uh, precision-based calculations. Uh, there's a class called like Big Decimal. Uh, there's other classes out there that you can use. Okay, but anyways, that's my parameter and that is the area. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna look at this equation and I'm gonna ask myself, hmm, I wonder if that four is ever gonna change, right? And like just say like I was using the number of sides of a square further down this program to do other types of things because this is a big program, a square calculator, and it's always like computing things for a square. Um, so what, you, what I want you to do this is what we call a literal value because there's literally just the four inside of our equation. So in this, in such a case, what I want, I want you to do is come up top here and just declare a constant for it. So you're gonna say final int num of sides. And just set that value equal to four. And then instead of using four for the number of sides of the square, you're gonna use number of sides. 
And then if there's another spot, like you had to do some other equation, you'll use it there as well. Okay. And it works just the same if I compile and I run. Okay. And I just use the same value, 5.2, and I get the same result. Any questions on that? Okay, so you have to kind of get used to using constants when you're typing out equations. I do not want to see literal values in equations. That is in our coding standard, and I also, I don't know if I actually explained that in the homework, but it is part of the coding standard. All right, let me hop back over here, and we're going to cover primitive data types. All right, this is a good one. So, yeah, it's really good. Okay, primitive data types. Okay, so in Java, there's eight primitive data types. Um, there's four that represent integers, the byte, the short, the int, and the long. Two of them represent floating point numbers, which is float and double. One of them represents a char, or excuse me, one of them represents characters, which is the char, and one of them represents Boolean values, and it's Boolean. And here is a table of the different sizes and max and min values. Um, I don't have, I, I personally don't have this memorized and I don't expect you to, but the thing that I do expect you to memorize is the storage size, right? So you should know a byte is eight bits. You should know a short is 16 bits, an int is 32 and a long is 64. For a float, 32 bits, a double is 64 bits, right? Those, those are things you're gonna have to know for your test. Um, if you know those, you can calculate what these values are. So two to the eighth power is 256. That means there's 256 possible values that you can represent with eight bits. So byte can represent 256 values. Now Java for integers does include the, like a negative range. So you can go from negative 128 to positive 127. The difference between a negative 128 and a 127, positive 127, is that you have to also account for the zero that's in between the negatives and the positives. Right, it does that for everything. So 16 bits, you can actually represent 64,000 possible values for 16 bits, but the max positive value that you can have for a short is 32,767. The lowest value is negative of uh, negative 32,768. Okay, and so on. Like I said, I don't have any of this memorized, but I do know that an integer, the highest value for an integer is about is a little over two billion. Okay, that's, that's all I remember, but for your exams, for the midterm and for the final, I just didn't expect you to know the bits for each one of these data types. Any questions on this? Right, numbers, that's integers and floating point values. The character, a character variable stores a single character. Character literals are delimited with single quotes, so we use a single quote to delimitate a, a character, where in a string we use a double quote. Here's some examples of declarations of a char. So they're saying top grade is A, and then uh, there's char terminator, which is a semicolon, and then there's separator, which is a space. It says, note the difference between a primitive character value, which holds only one character, and a string object, which can hold multiple characters. Okay, there's a big difference between the two. A string is just a collection of chars. Right, where a char is just one character. A character set is an order list of characters with each character corresponding to unique number. A char variable in Java can store any character from the Unicode character set. The Unicode character set uses 16 bits per character allowing for 65,536 unique characters. It is an international character set containing symbols and characters from many different languages. Okay, so the char is 16 bits. Okay, that's something you need to know. In Java, we use a Unicode character set. Um, so the way the Unicode character set works is the int value will map to a particular character. So the first value would be zero, and at zero, I forgot what character is there, but it's, I don't, I don't know, what it, like symbol and noise, something like that. But as you progress through the Unicode character set, the uh, first 128 characters are from the ASCII character set, which includes um, all the alphabet, the numbers, like whatever uh, symbols we use in punctuation, like semicolons and square brackets and stuff like that. 
Um, it talks about the ASCII character set. Next slide. So the ASCII character set is an older, sm smaller than the Unicode character set, but is quite popular. The ASCII characters are a subset of the Unicode character set, including the upper letters, lowercase letters, punctuation, digits, symbols, and control characters. Okay, so there's positions for these all in these locations. All right, and Boolean. A Boolean value represents true or false condition. The reserved word true and false are only valid values for the Boolean type. So I know in C++ and other programming languages, you can use a one and a zero uh, in substitution of true and false. But in the Java programming language, that is not the case. It's either a true or a false. You can't use a one or a zero. A Boolean variable can also be used to represent any two states, such as a light bulb being on and off. And then that is the end of primitive data types. Okay, so there's still a lot to talk about here. So I'm gonna have to go into an, a code example to explain some of this stuff. But if you're also reading the textbook, which you should read, right? You shouldn't just rely on the lecture slides. Um, it does tell you about the different types of literal values that you can have. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that really quick because it's important to know uh, what a literal value is. So we already talked about a string literal. That's just a character is wrapped with a double quote. They talked about the char literal, which is the single quote. Uh, we have used an int literal already, right? An int literal is just writing a number into the code, right? Um, so here, right here, that's an int literal, right? If you write an integer into Java, it's going to treat it as an integer. So it's literally that value right there. Um, whenever we wrote a decimal value, let me hop back to decimal value. Where did I do that? Uh, I did that right here. This is a double literal. Okay, Java treated that as a double. Whenever you have a number with a fractional part, it's going to see it as a double. Um, however, there is this weird case where if you wanted to initialize a float and you try to type in a fractional value, Java's still going to see that value as a double, which is 64 bits, trying to go inside of a float, which is 32, and it's not going to compile. Okay, so those are, the types, those are types of nuances I want to demonstrate. So I'm going to go ahead and hop into an example. Okay, so I did do this for my online class, and I called it something like, oh, shoot, what the heck? Um, I don't know. Um, I called it something like primitive data types examples. I don't know. Yeah, the eight primitive data types. Um, so there's already a lecture or a video on that. So I'm going to go ahead and name this one. Uh, I, I'll use the same name. I'll copy the same name because I'm not really... I don't really come up with great ideas. So eight primitive data types, two, okay? So there you go. So there's a one, there's a eight primitive data types and it's eight primitive data types two. I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna go ahead and create this class. So public class, eight primitive data types two, open close curly braces, come in here and write my uh, method header. So public static void main string array arguments. All right, and I'm going to do all my work inside of here, but I'm going to come up here and put this up here, name and info. It's all going to go right there. Okay, so inside of here, I'm going to go ahead and just declare some data types. So I'm going to declare the four integer types, okay? So let me go ahead and label this real quick. Uh, the four integer types. So an integer is essentially a whole number, right? It can be zero, a negative value, a positive, but it's not gonna have any fractional part associated with it. Okay, so I'm gonna make a byte and I'm gonna call this one, um, I don't know, my byte. All right, and I'm gonna make a short. I'm gonna call this one my short. And an int, I'm gonna call this one my int, and then a long. Okay, and let's remember that the byte is 8 bits, and the short is 16. The int is 32.
and the long is 64. Okay, so that's just my declaration. So I, all I did was just declare those variables. So now I'm gonna assign them different values. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say, okay, well, I want my byte to be um, seven and my short is gonna be, okay, it can go up to 32,000. So I'm just gonna make, let me say like 30,000. And then my int can go up to two billion. So we'll just, oops, I didn't mean to do that. It's three zeros, uh, three zeros. Did they do that right? Three, no, that's four, what the heck? All right, so that is, that's right there, 100,000. Yeah, I think that's two billion, right? Or do I need one more set of threes? That's it? Oh, two million, okay, yeah. Then a billion is another set, okay. So now I'm gonna do my long, and for now I'm just gonna, in my long I'm just gonna hold uh, two billion as well. Okay, all right, I'm gonna do system.out.println, I'm gonna just print out these values really quick. And I'm gonna just copy what I did here. I wish I would've named it something easier to, to like, uh, curve, you know, change. Okay, so short. Um, just no, I'm, I'm just clicking it. I'm double clicking it. So, I, and then I do Control C to copy, and then Control V to paste. It, and on Mac, it's Command C and Command V. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and compile this. It does compile, that's always a good sign. And now I'm going, go, I'm going to run, and there are my values, right? So I have a short, I have, or excuse me, I have a byte, I have a short, an int, and a long, okay? But let's, let's go ahead and make a long that is actually out of range, or not out of range, but in range of a long, but out of range of an integer. So we know that two billion is, two billion something is the highest that we can go on an int. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this five billion. I'm gonna go to save this, I'm gonna try to compile, and then right off the bat, Java's upset at me. It's telling me that the integer number is too large, five billion, okay? And it's pointing to what I just did. I'm saving this into a long, so this should be okay. But what's actually happening is, Java's seeing that as an integer, meaning like it's trying to convert that to an int, like in place, and it's saying that's, that's out of range for an integer, it needs to be the highest value for an int is two billion something, right? But I have five billion. So I wanna tell Java, no Java, this is a long, I wanna treat it as a long. Then I need to use a lowercase l or a capital L. I prefer using the capital L because a lowercase l looks like an, a one, which can kind of be misleading. So I'm gonna use the uppercase L. And now when I save and compile this, Java is okay with it, right? So now it's treating that value as what we call a long literal. Okay, so there's, this is a 64-bit integer now. So when I compile and I run, I can get my value in my long to be five billion, okay? That is the long literal. Now with the short, excuse me, the, with, the, uh, with the byte, now if Java sees each one of these as integers, why is it okay to store this integer, which is 32 bits, into this byte, which is eight bits? Okay, now what's happening is, if for the byte and the short, if Java sees that the variable that you're saving these values into, is a, a byte or a short, and if the literal value you're storing is in range of the byte or the short, it's gonna convert it to a byte or a short. Okay, but if I go outside of my range to say we know that 127 is the highest possible value for a byte, if I make it 128, then we're gonna run into some problems. So I'm gonna save that, compile, and Java's telling me possible loss of conversion uh, from int to byte. Okay, so it's telling me you're trying to take this int and you're trying to save it into a byte, um, but that's and it, like that's too big for a byte. Okay, so you have to know your range. So what I'm going to do simply is just change that to 127, 
I can save, compile, it compiles now, and I run, and you can see the value is 127 now. All right, so you have to be careful with that. Same thing for the short. If I were to change this to, instead of 30,000, I would have changed it to 33,000. When I compile, I get the same problem. This is gonna have to be in a range of a short. So compile and I run, and 32,000 is an unallowed value for my short. Any questions on that so far? Yes. Uh, well, it, when you're casting, right? So we'll talk about casting actually in this later on in chapter two. But when you're writing literal values, like you're, it, you're like you're actually telling Java you want this value inside of this variable, and if it can't hold it, right? Java's gonna say I, I can't do it for you, right? But if you actually want to force that value, then yeah, you can cast. And then it would actually what we do like what you said it was just gonna it's gonna flip it's gonna like if I made this 128 okay so we know that 127 is the highest possible value does anybody know what the lowest possible value for a byte is okay negative 128 so if I made this uh, 128 and I try to come over here and cast this to a byte okay Java's gonna be okay with this it's gonna be, okay I'm gonna go ahead and make 128 a byte okay so now it compiled, and when I run, you can see that the value is negative 128. So yes, it does uh, like overlap, like, like it's a, basically a cycle, but you have to explicitly tell Java you want to force that value to be a byte. And you do that by casting, and that is something that we'll talk about in actually, I don't know, the next, well, after you talk about expressions, data conversion is going to be where we learn about casting, okay? But yes, you can't do that, but when you're using literals, you can't do that. All right, I'm gonna save that. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you was the uh, double and the float. So I'm gonna go ahead and type those in now. So I'm gonna say float, I'm gonna say my float. And this is going to be 32 bits. I don't know why I put a semicolon there. And then a double. And this is going to be 64. All right, and I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna assign them some value. We'll say my float, oops, my float is equal to, and for now I'm just gonna put a seven, right? And then I'm gonna say, my double is equal to 7.5, okay. Save that, come over here and print those values out. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and compile. And whoops, upset. Oh, because I got rid of that cast. Uh, put that back to 127. Compile. It's happy with me. I'm going to run. And then I just created a float and a double. You can see that even though I passed it an integer value, 7, I did get the 0, the point zero in my float. Okay, now, and this is an integer literal right here. Integer literal is 32 bits, and so is a float. A float is also 32 bits, so this conversion is okay. Java's okay with this, but what do you think is gonna happen if I put 7.5 here, assign that value to my float? Does anybody know what's gonna happen? It's gonna, I'm sorry, what's that? It, an it will give me an error, right? If, um, and the error is gonna be that Java actually sees that 7.5 as a 64-bit double, so it's actually pointing to that location where you try to assign the value to the float. It's telling you, that there's a possible loss of conversion converting the double to a float. It sees this as a 64-bit float, not a 32, or excuse me, 64-bit double, not a 32-bit float, okay? So um, the only way to force this to be a float literal is this, it's similar to what we had to do for the long. We're gonna just use an F at the end. The F will tell Java that make that a 32-bit float instead of a 64-bit double. So now when I compile um, and run, 
it works, right? You, you get 7.5. Okay, so I know that's kind of quirky, right? Like when I was over here, right, it knew to make that a byte, but for some reason, it doesn't know to make this a float, okay? So you just have to know whenever you want a float literal, you are gonna have to put an F at the end of it. It could be a lowercase or an uppercase F. Um, but if you don't, Java is going to treat it as a 64-bit double, and you can only store that value into a double. Any questions on that? Well, uh, does anybody have like? Can anybody think of why we would want to use a float over over a double? No, actually, the double holds more. Okay, so I mean the. The whole reason that we have these different values that are different sizes is for memory management, okay? So if you don't really need to have a precision, so a double, did we talk about that? We just finished primitive data types. I don't know if I mentioned that. Let me, let me hop back. So a double has 14 significant digits, if I remember correctly. Wait, where is the slide? Oh, 15 significant digits, that me that's meaning that means that they can have 15 possible numbers inside of whatever uh, value that's there, where a float will only have seven. So the, re like the, the purpose behind the float and the double is the different sizes. If you don't really need that type of precision, then you'll just use a float. Do you have a question? So using like using 32 bits, right, to represent a number that you don't really care that much about the fractional part. Meaning, like, just say if I'm just taking test grades in this class, do I really need to have anything more than the uh, tenths place of a fraction, right? Because that seems like overkill. Um, but in like in systems, I know like in a lot of computers, like there's a lot of memory now, right? So it doesn't make sense. But a lot of our like programming styles now are, are things that we code for are for mobile devices or like even now like cars or computers now, right? They're not gonna have as much memory. So in a situation where you want to actually conserve memory, you don't wanna use a value that is going to be like too accurate for what you actually want it for, right? Does that make sense? So, so like having less will be less power consumption and having to go Right, exactly. So when you store that value in memory, it's only taking up 32 bits and not 64 bits. So let, let, let me ask, like, let me bring up this other point too, because I think this is a good uh, thing to think about as well. I mean, we have a byte, and I know a lot. Of, I don't really use bytes that much, uh, but there's situations where I'm like, I should probably just use a byte for this because uh, even though I don't care about like memory, because I'm writing these programs for on my computer uh, to give you guys demonstrations, uh, a byte goes from negative 127 to positive 128, or I'm sorry, negative one, negative 128 to positive 127. So if, I'm, if I want an integer that's going to represent the age of a dog, right? Like, like how old does a dog really get? Like 10, 15 years? It gets kind of old, you know, by, I don't know, I don't know, if, I don't know a dog who's lived over 20 years, right? Uh, do I really need an integer which can hold like 2 billion positive values? No, right? So um, it's more efficient to use a number that is going to be within the range of what you're actually trying to use it for. Okay, and a lot of these examples, though, like in the book and all that, they don't really stress the importance of that. Um, so you'll see them using like an integer for, I don't know, uh, like age or something like that, right? Now, there are people who get over 127 years old, so maybe use a short instead. But um, an integer, I mean, it goes up to 2 billion, right? So, I mean, those are just things to think about. I know like this book kind of more focuses on just teaching you the basics and not so much uh, writing efficient code. But as a programmer, it's always good programming practice to think about who you're targeting, right? If you're targeting a mobile device, you don't want to put like, you don't want to make huge objects or use a lot of the memory because you want your program to be as efficient as possible so you can do other things, right? Okay. 
but that was a good question though. All right, so that is it for the n numerical values. So there are two more val two more primitive data types that I want to go over. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about first is one that we're going to use a lot in chapter five and six, and that's just simply the Boolean value. Uh, there really isn't a good way to explain or dem demonstrate the Boolean value right right now um, without using like conditions and stuff like that. But a Boolean can either be true or it can be false, right? Those are the only possible values that you can have in Java are just those two values. And it's just simply going to just print out whatever state it's in. So if I come over here and I print that out, bool. So I'm going to compile and then run. And there is my output, right? My bool is false, right? And it can either be false or true. And in chapter five and chapter six, we're going to use Boolean values to control loops and decisions, make decisions for us. But for now, we um, just have to know that the possible values for a Boolean is true and false. The other one is the char. Okay, now this one's a little more interesting because you can have a char, and I'm just going to say like my char. And to create a char literal, we can use the uh, single quotes. And I could just put like one character in here. I just put like a lowercase u and then a semicolon, and then I'll come down here. And then I'll use that value. All right, compile, run, and you can see that I, there's my char right there, right? Pretty exciting stuff. Okay, now the char does come from the Unicode character set that we talked about. There is a there's 65,000 possible characters, um, so you can actually use a number as a as the value that you want for a char right so if I, I just say like i knew what uh character i wanted from the unicode character set i could just come over here and type in a number like 67 and i can compile that and it compiles right and java's okay with this and then i go ahead and i run this and at 67 you have capital c in your unicode character set if you have your book if you go back to the i forgot what appendix it is but in the back of the book, there's an appendix that kind of goes over the Unicode character set. It doesn't have the entire table, uh, but if you go online, it, it will give you the entire table. But there's some interesting characters past uh, the ASCII character set, which is 128. Now, depending on the operating system that you actually uh, display those characters on, you may or may not see them. Okay, you have to, you have to actually have the character set installed on your computer and able to see. In, in, in order to see uh, some of the values. Okay, so one of the other things that you can do is you can take a numeric integer and cast it to a char and then get some value. So if, just say, if I made uh, integer, you know, 1,000, okay? Now I wanted to grab that int. I didn't mean to do that. I wanted to grab that int and I wanted to Whatever values in that integer, I want my char to be at that location in the Unicode character set. If I go to compile, it's going to be really upset at me because it knows that that variable is an integer and now you want to make it a char. Before, it had no problem. But at this moment, because you're using the integer, like Java, the compiler really doesn't know what the moment, like, okay, well, what value is currently in there, right? So you're actually going to have to force this to a char. If you wanted to use a char, you would just cast it. And now you can compile, and you can run, and you can see what's at 1,000. Now, it does say question mark, right? But it uses a command prompt will use a question mark when it doesn't know what a character actually is. So it's probably some weird character that is not on this operating system. So that is uh, what's going on there. That's why there's a question mark there. Okay, so that is it. But before I... Stop with this example. I wanted to go ahead and just like write a quick for loop. So I want to make, we'll talk about for loops in chapter five and six, so don't be concerned about what I'm typing right now, but I'm going to say for uh, integer x is equal to zero while x, while x is less than, and we'll go up to 200. We're going to increment x for every iteration of this loop. And then what I'm going to do is just print out the possible values of the char at that location. So I'm going to say um, 
char c oops char c is equal to x and i'm going to cast this to a char and i'm going to make a string where i have x and then i'm going to concatenate a string in between and then i'm going to uh, put in c i am going to turn up my volume because some of these characters are actually uh, sounds um, so let me just turn on my volume up really quick. Let me see. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it because the speaker on my computer. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and compile this. It does compile. I'm gonna go ahead and run. Oh, I guess, oh yeah, that's right. That sound is going through the HDMI, which is going through this, whatever speaker is for that projector. Okay, so if we go back and look at this, you can see at 199, we have this weird looking C with like a little, I, I know it might be a little difficult to see, um, but we have a C with some type of mark at the bottom of it, just like an A, E, like kind of ran together. I don't know what any of that stuff is, but if you actually scroll up, you can actually see the start of the ASCII character set at zero. Those question marks there are some control characters or something. Uh, scroll down, you can see where the um, explanation mark and some of the punctuation marks start. You can see where your numbers start, right? So at location 48, you start with zero, and then you can see where your alphabet starts. You actually start off with capital letters before you start off with lowercase letters, right? The lowercase letters like are in the 100s or like the, where was that? That's the 70s. The lowercase letters were yeah, at 97 and then on. And then as I continue down, you can see a bunch of question marks, meaning it didn't know what was, was supposed to be at that location. But in some cases, you'll see like some weird characters like that one, right, or that. Okay, so there are some uh, characters that it was able to understand and show on the screen. All right, does anybody have any questions on this? I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, yeah. Uh, but this, this uh, example is on Dropbox, the one that's shared. But, yeah, all that code is there. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there because um, the next topic we're going to talk about is expressions. And this is where it gets kind of complicated because we're going to start actually doing multiplication, division, all that kind of stuff. And then we're going to end it with... Uh, the next or next class, we're going to talk about uh, casting, which I already went over. So that should kind of go pretty quick. And then interactive programs, which is using the scanner class. I've already demonstrated that to you, but I'm going to actually read the lecture slides, and we'll talk about the different methods that you can call on the scanner object.